Hello, in this lecture we're going to be discussing antiderivatives and indefinite integration. Let's start with a simple example. Let's say we have f of x equals 2x. So a question we might ask is, what is a function whose derivative is 2x? So what is a function whose derivative is 2x, whose derivative is 2x. And it's a pretty easy question. If you already know calculus, um, you might say x squared, right? x squared is an example of a function whose derivative is 2x because you can bring the two down and you can subtract one from the exponent and basically just applying the power rule and you'll get 2x. I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call it big F of X. And this is an example of what's called an antiderivative. So this is an antiderivative. So we would say that X squared is an antiderivative for 2X because the derivative of X squared is equal to 2X. So the thing is, there's other <laughs> possible answers. For example, let's say I say big F of X is equal to X squared plus one. Well, if you take the derivative here, you're gonna get the same thing, you're gonna get two x. The derivative of x squared is two x, and the derivative of one is zero, so you're gonna get the same answer. So this is also an antiderivative for two x. In fact, we can look at big F of x and call it x squared plus any number, I'll use a capital C, and this is also an antiderivative for two x. This one has a name, this one's called the general antiderivative. And this C here, it's an arbitrary constant. That's the word we often use, arbitrary constant. So it could be any number. We don't know, that's an R there, arbitrary. <laughs> this is hard to read though. So A-R-B-I-T-R-A-R-Y, arbitrary constant. So there's infinitely many antiderivatives for 2x. Let me just go ahead and give you the definition so you have it in one place. So we say a function, big F is an antiderivative, so antiderivative of little f on some interval i, so I'll say on an interval i if whenever you take the derivative of big f it's equal to little f and this is true for all x in your intervals so for all x in i so that's the the definition of an antiderivative and typically in a calculus class um, you do use this um, but in the actual problems that you do in calculus you don't use it too much. This would come up a little bit more in like maybe like a proof-based class or something like that. The point is though that there's infinitely many, right? There's infinitely many. And now let's talk about what integration is. And I'm gonna give you the notation. I'm gonna switch colors here. Oh, before I do though, um, let's actually do it with respect to this example. So that way it doesn't look so abstract. So here's the notation that we're going to use. So the process of, of finding an antiderivative is called anti-differentiation, right? We're going backwards. So instead of differentiating, we're anti-differentiating. And here's the notation we use. So we have this elongated S symbol. This is called like the integral symbol. So it's the integral symbol. And here we have two X and then we have DX. And we said that our best answer was this one, X squared plus C. So in this example, which we did in our head, we looked at the 2x and we said, what's a function whose derivative is 2x? We said x squared. This is the notation you would use. So this process of finding an antiderivative is called anti-differentiation or integration. So this piece here has a name. This is called the integrand. It's really important to know this because when you're talking to people about mathematics, you say, well, my integrand, you know, I couldn't factor it, or you know, you can talk about the integrand because, because you know what it is. Um, this piece here, this dx, this tells you what variable 
you're integrating with respect to. So I'll just say variable of integration. So because it's math, we have more than one variable. Sometimes we integrate with respect to y, in which case you would put a dy. Sometimes you do theta, sometimes you do r. If you study multivariable calculus, you'll do x, y, and z in the same problem. So you'll have dx, dy, dz. So it tells you the variable. So here the variable is x. This here is our antiderivative, x squared. In fact, this whole thing is an antiderivative. You could, you could say x squared plus c is the antiderivative, but I'm just going to single out x squared just so I can label this one as well. This one has a name. We called it an arbitrary constant, but it's actually called the constant of integration. Okay, it's the constant of integration. It's really important to include it. There's infinitely many solutions, right? There's infinitely many choices for C. There's infinitely many antiderivatives. Really, really important to note. And this elongated S looks like someone took the letter S and stretched it. Uh, this is the integral symbol. So again, this process of um, finding a function whose derivative is 2x, this process of going backwards, it's called anti-differentiation or integration. This is called an indefinite integral. So indefinite integral. I'm going to write that down. So this is an indefinite indefinite integral. A natural question then comes into play. What is a definite integral? A definite integral is different. You're going to have like numbers here. Like you might have a 3 here and a 4 here. That's called a definite integral. Those are studied later. Uh, you have to learn about Riemann sums and some stuff like that. But for now, we're going to stick with indefinite. So in general, um, to do this, it's pretty tough, right? Like we had to, you know, I picked this example for this video because it's easy, right? So I wanted to pick something that most people who know very, very basic calculus can do and understand. Yeah, okay, what's a function whose derivative is 2x uh, x squared? But if I say, hey, what's a function whose derivative is, you know, x plus 1 over x cubed plus 1 minus the secant of x? Like, you know, what, what, what's that going to be? Well, it's a little bit more difficult, right? So you need formulas uh, in order to do these problems. So now I'm going to give you a list of all of the basic formulas that you need for integration. So formulas. And we'll justify each one, at least logically. And in some cases, I'll be able to give you an example. Uh, in some cases, I really won't, not until, until later. So the first formula we're going to look at is if we're trying to integrate 0. Okay, 0. We're looking for uh, the antiderivative of 0. We're trying to anti-differentiate 0. So lots of ways to say similar things. So this integral, uh, we have to integrate 0. So you ask, what's a function whose derivative um, is zero. Well, any constant function will work. Let's just go with C, right? C will work because if you take the derivative of C, um, you're going to get zero, right? The derivative of a constant is zero. So that one's pretty easy. How about this one? Let's say we have a constant, which I'll call K, with respect to X. So the variable is X. What's a function whose derivative is X? Well, it's going to be KX. And then, of course, plus our constant of integration. And you can always check your answer. If you differentiate this, you should get the integrand. See how important it was to know what it's called? It helps to know. So the derivative of x is 1, so we just get k. And the derivative of c is 0, so it goes away. Let's do an example with this one. We can do a simple one. Let's say we want to integrate 2 with respect to x. So in this case, there's two ways to do it. Method one, you ask yourself, what's a function whose derivative is 2? Hmm, 2x. And then don't forget the plus c. Method two, which is the way I do it, which is much more mindless, uh, it requires less brain cells. You see the 2, it's a constant by itself. You just put an x next to it. Simple, right? doesn't matter how tired you are <laughs> or how much math you've been doing. If it's a number by itself and it's with respect to x, you put an x. Actually, this leads me to a point Let's say instead it was 3d theta. Hey, what? What's going on? Trig? Yeah, I want to introduce a theta. Why not, right? So in this case, it's 3 theta plus c. So it depends on the variable. That's the purpose of this. It tells you 
what the variable of integration is. So in this case, it's d theta, so we put a theta. If it's dr, you put an r, et cetera. All right, let's go to our next formula, which I'm just doing these off the top of my head. Um, how about this one? If you have a constant times a function, okay, you can pull the constant out because it doesn't depend on the variable x. So this is equal to k times f of x dx. This will come up sometimes later. Just know that if you have a number, you can, you can pull it out and, and there's no issue. As a concrete example, I guess I could do one here. It's a little bit silly, but let's do it. Let's say you're trying to integrate uh, five with respect to x. You're saying, huh, I don't really like the five, so I'm going to pull it out. So you pull it out <laughs> and you're just left with one dx. And you say, oh, one, I can integrate one. That's just x, right? Because one times x is x. The derivative of x is one. So the integral of x, uh, integral of one is x rather. So to integrate one, <laughs> you just use this rule, right? So you just put an x next to it. So you just get five x plus c. So a pretty useless move here, right? So you integrate this and you get x and then you just multiply by five and you get your answer. So not very useful uh, in this particular case, kind of a pointless example. But the point is you can pull numbers out, which can be useful sometimes, uh, just not in this particular case here. <laughs> this next rule is very useful. It says if you have more than one term in your integrand, you can separate it into two integrals. So if you have, say, f of x plus or minus g of x with respect to x, you can break this up into two separate integrals. We have the integral of f of x with respect to x plus or minus the integral of g of x with respect to x. Very useful. Uh, and once we know more, I can do an example of this. But basically, it means you can integrate term by term. If you have five things, you can break it up into five integrals. That's okay as well. Five. Uh, this next one's really important. It's called the power rule. There's so many power rules in mathematics that it almost pains me to use the word, but it's okay. Context is key. So this is the power rule for integration. So if you have x to a power, say x to the n, and you're integrating this with respect to x, so what you can do is basically you just take the exponent and you add one. So this is x to the n plus one, and then you just divide by the one, and then you add your constant of integration, capital C. So very, very powerful rule. Now, if you're thinking like, I don't wanna say a math person, but sometimes you get into the habit of thinking, hmm, when doesn't it work? Well, when doesn't this work? Well, if n is negative one, it doesn't work. So this is only valid for n not equal to negative one, okay? And the natural question then to ask is, what do you do when n is negative one? I'll show you, and I'm gonna put it in red up here. If you have x to the negative one, this is later, this is gonna be the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. And this, this is something you learn later in calculus. Uh, we're not gonna be discussing it in this video. It's, it's taught much later. But for every other choice of n, um, you can use this formula. So very powerful. Let's do an example right away so you see it. So let's say we have to integrate x to the fourth with respect to x. So in this case, a newcomer to the study of calculus might say, hmm, okay, so the exponent here is four. This is the value of n. So if I'm going to apply this formula, it's x to the four plus one over four plus one plus c. And that would be 100% correct. And so this is equal to x to the five over five plus c. So this would be the answer. Now, in general, um, you do want to eventually move past this type of computation. Um, you want to eventually skip this work because it really clutters your problem. So when you see a problem like this, let's just say x cubed dx, you basically jump to the solution. Three plus one is four, and then you just divide by the four, like that, plus c. So you wanna skip this middle step. It's not wrong, it's just, it really like slows you down and it's just, <laughs> the math gets really long and involved. So anytime you can skip a step that's very, very easy to do mentally like this, it's recommended that you do. 
And this just doesn't look pretty when you have six of these in the same problem, you know, so uh, worth just going to the answer. So very, very powerful formula. Okay, I think what's left now are the trig functions. I guess I've been numbering these, so I'll call this one six. And the trig functions often intimidate people because uh, people see these formulas and they think, oh, wow, I'm supposed to memorize all of these? You are, but at the same time, you can think about them uh, a little bit differently. So I'm going to show you uh, how I think about these, and maybe that will work for you. So let me just switch colors here. For some reason, my pen got really thick. I had to, I can control how thick my writing is. Watch this. I can write really thick, <laughs> or I can write really thin. I'm just trying to find a, a happy ground here. Here we go. Let's try this one. So let's try to integrate. That's pretty good. Oh, I'm using graffiti pen. There we go. Let's go back to pen. Let's try cosine x. There we go. Back to regular writing. The integral of cosine x. So when you're trying to integrate cosine, you're asking yourself, what is a function whose derivative is cosine? Sine. So this is sine x, but that's not it. We still need the plus c. So pretty easy. So whenever you look at the integral of cosine, if you don't have it memorized, you can memorize it. You can say, hey, the integral of cosine is sine. But maybe there's just, there's, you're just having a hard time finding room in your brain to memorize it, and you're just refusing to memorize things, which I have a habit of doing. I like to know how things are derived, and it's just a habit. So you're trying to integrate cosine. You say, oh, I forgot what that was. Oh, but wait, what's a function whose derivative is cosine? Oh, sine. The derivative of sine is cosine. Yep, checks. You differentiate this, you should get your integrand, and it certainly works because the derivative of sine is cosine. What about this one? There's a reason I did cosine first, because it's easier. This one's harder. So what's a function whose derivative is going to be sine? Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So this is going to be negative cosine x, and then plus our constant. And you can check, right? The derivative of cosine is negative sine. We've already got a negative here, so negative and negative is positive, so life is good. <laughs> About this one here, secant x, tangent x. These are strategically picked, by the way. You might say, what about secant? Why'd you jump to secant tangent? Secant is a whole nother story, right? <laughs> Integration is not as easy as differentiation. The integral of secant requires uh, other techniques, which we'll learn later. So you have secant times tangent. What's a function whose derivative is secant tangent? Well, secant. This is the secant of x plus our constant of integration, capital C. And how about secant squared? That's another one we can do now. Secant squared x dx. So what's a function whose derivative is secant squared? Well, that's just going to be tangent x plus c. Right, because the derivative of tangent is secant squared. And then we get to the unpopular ones, the ones that don't come up so much. Cosecant x, cotangent x, dx. So what's a function whose derivative is cosecant cotangent? Well, the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent, so this requires a negative cosecant x plus c. Again, the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. We've already got a negative, so it will become positive. And the last one we're going to discuss in this video, the last formula, I know it's a lot of formulas, is cosecant squared x dx. And in this case, you ask yourself, what's a function whose derivative is cosecant squared? Well, the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared, so this is going to be negative cotangent of x plus our constant of integration, capital C. So, wow, that's a lot of formulas. And usually when people first see this, they're like, OMG, how am I ever going to know this? But how did I just go over it, right? It's just all derivatives. So it's really the derivatives that give you the integrals. And at least for me, that seems to work better. It stays in my long-term memory. Um, it just works better because, you know, you integrate other stuff besides these things. You know, you might have to integrate sine to the fourth power someday. That requires trig identities, requires a lot of knowledge. So um, I just feel like the less you memorize sometimes the better. And thinking about it in terms of differentiation uh, makes it a little bit easier. Let's go ahead and do an example. I'm going to switch back to white. And let's just do a simple example here. Let's say we have um, x 
to the negative four, maybe not so simple, plus five, plus um, sine x dx. So now we have three terms, right? Three terms, and we saw earlier that one of the rules said if we have two terms, we can break it up into two pieces, but if you have three, you can do it also. You can break it up into three. Uh, the rule can be easily generalized, generalized to any finite number of terms inside the integrand. All right, so let's just jump into it. By the way, when you integrate, you drop the integral sign and you drop the dx, okay? So, uh, so we're going straight to the answer here. So here, we have x to the negative four, so we can apply the power rule. So we'll add one to that. So it'll be x, negative four plus one is negative three, and then you divide by the negative three, okay? Plus, you have a number by itself, just tack on an x. Trig function, hmm, what's a function whose derivative is sine? Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so this is going to be negative cosine x, and then plus our constant of integration capital C. It's not good form to leave your answer like this, so the negative on the bottom looks bad. I'm gonna write it like this, negative one-third times x to the negative three plus five x minus cosine x plus c, and that would be an acceptable final answer. Um, some people ask about whether or not you should bring the this down, like you, this piece here, and write it like this, negative one-third, one over x cubed. I think it doesn't matter. Um, different people do it different ways. I've seen solutions in the back of books. They do it this way, they do it this way. Some people will do this, which I really don't like. <laughs> it's just more work. I personally prefer to leave it like this. So that is a simple example of indefinite integration. Okay, let's do this example here. We have the integral of x to the three halves plus two x plus one. And again, the dx here tells us what the variable of integration is. So solution. So in this case, we can go ahead and just jump into it and use the formulas. So we're gonna go straight to the integration. So here we can use the power rule. We actually have a three halves. And remember the power rule says that whenever you have uh, x to a power, as long as that power is not negative one, you're basically adding one here to the exponent. So three halves plus one, you come over here and write it, three halves plus one, that's the same thing as three halves plus two halves, and I'm writing it that way so that we can actually you know, perform the addition. Um, three plus two is five, so you get five halves. So what you would do is you would write x, the five halves, and then you would divide, and then you put the five halves down here. Okay, plus, same thing here, we have a number. Remember, when you have a number in front of an x, it just hangs out, so two. Then we have x, the exponent here is one, so one plus one is two, and again, we divide by the two. Again, the power rule, right? You add one and divide, add one and divide. So we added one to three halves, we got five halves, we divided by five halves. Added one to the one, we got two, we divided by two. Whenever you have a number by itself, remember, just tack on the x, so one times x is just x. Not correct, we're still missing the plus C. Typically, you don't wanna leave your answer like this, right, it's not simplified and you have a complex fraction here, so let's clean it up. What's happening here is a division problem. We have this divided by five halves. When you divide, you really multiply by the reciprocal. So this is really two fifths times X to the five halves. Boom, this goes away plus x squared, plus x, and then plus our constant of integration, capital C. And that would be an acceptable uh, final answer uh, in this example here. So super, super key. So again, just adding, adding one here. So two halves plus three halves is five halves, divide by five halves. One plus one is two, divide by two. You have a constant by itself, you just tack on the x, and then you have a plus C. Pro, and then these cancel, 
This is a division problem. When you divide by five halves, you're really multiplying by the reciprocal. Let's do another one. The best way to get good at integration is just to do a bunch of integrals. I mean, there's no better way um, to get good at it. I want to emphasize a point about fractions. So I'm going to do this. This is negative one half plus one half dx. Okay, let's make one up. So here we can use the power rule twice. Okay, let's go ahead and do it. Solution. So we're going to add one to negative one half. So that's going to be negative one half plus one, which is really negative one half plus two halves, which is one half. So it'll be x to the one half divided by one half plus, same thing here, we have a one half, we're adding one. So it's one half plus two halves, which is three halves. So it's x to the three halves divided by three halves. And then we have our constant of integration, capital C. And then again, we have these two division problems, right? Whenever you divide, you multiply by the reciprocal. So dividing by one half is the same thing as multiplying by two. So this will be two x to the one half, which you can write as the square root of x, it's up to you, plus, and then dividing by three halves is the same thing as multiplying by two thirds. So this is two thirds x to the three halves plus c. So that would be an acceptable answer. Now, this is not how I would do the problem. So I'm just doing it this way to show you. So let me show you what I would do when we're faced with a situation like this. I would take a shortcut. Let's say we have x to the one third plus x to the two sevenths dx. Just dealing with these really bad fractions that no one wants to deal with. Let's do it. Solution. So we're adding one, right? We're adding one and dividing. We're using that power rule. So we have x to the one third, and then here we have x to the two sevenths. So here it's one third plus one. So think of it as a number over three. So one third plus three thirds, so four thirds. So it'll be x to the four thirds, okay? And we're dividing by four thirds. But when you divide by four thirds, you're really multiplying by three fourths. Boom. So you skip that step. So whenever you divide by a fraction, you can automatically turn it into multiplication by the reciprocal. Super, super powerful, right? So powerful. It saves you so much time. So again, we add one to the one third, which is four thirds. We divide by four thirds. But instead of dividing by four thirds, since it's going to require cleanup anyways, just multiply by the reciprocal. Same thing here, plus. We have two sevenths plus one. So think of seven, uh, think of one as a number over seven, which is seven sevenths. So it's going to be nine sevenths. So this will be x to the nine sevenths divided by nine sevenths. So it'll be seven ninths times x to the nine sevenths. Again, it's x to the nine sevenths. Then you divide by nine sevenths, but you're really multiplying by the reciprocal, which is seven ninths. But that's not it. We're still missing something super important. It's the plus C. So yeah. So whether or not you're comfortable skipping this step is up to you. It's a personal choice. If you want to show it every time, that's fine, right? We did that uh, up here, right? We divided by one half, here we divided by three halves, and then we flipped it when we multiplied by the reciprocal. So it's up to you uh, whether you show um, those, those steps or not. Let's do another one. Uh, how about something like this, a little bit simpler? One over x cubed. So this is one where you can't just use the power rule right away, right? Remember the power rule works on x to a power. Here we have one over x to a power. So what you have to do here is you have to rewrite your integrand. See how good it is to have a name for that? So the integrand is this here. It's called the integrand. So we have to rewrite it. So because we're not integrating yet, we still have to write the integral symbol. So solution. So what we can do is we can bring this upstairs. And when we do that, the exponent will become negative. So this will become a negative 3. And then here we have a dx. 
And so now we can apply the power rule. So when we apply the power rule, we drop the integral sign, we take one and we add it to the exponent. So it'll be x, so let's see, negative three plus two is negative one, uh, is negative two. Negative three plus one is negative two, misspoke. We're adding one, negative three plus one is negative two, and then you divide by negative two, and then plus our constant of integration. Okay, this is equal to, so now what you can do here is you can write this as negative one half, x to the negative two, plus our constant of integration, capital C. And that would be a perfectly acceptable way to write the answer. Some people would prefer to do this. You could certainly do that. And you could certainly do something like this. I probably wouldn't do this, not a fan. I prefer to do it this way, the easiest way, at least in my opinion. Okay, let's integrate this. We have the integral of x cubed minus 2x plus 4, all divided by x cubed. So we have a fraction. So let's go ahead and try to work through its solution. So because we have a single term on the bottom, this is called a monomial, a good idea is to try to break this up into lots of little pieces. So we still have the integral sign because we're not integrating yet. And so it'll be x cubed over x cubed. So x cubed over x cubed and then minus and then 2x over x cubed, so 2x over x cubed. So it's this over this minus this over this, and then plus, and then 4 over x cubed like that. Boom, beautiful, really nice. Parentheses, and then don't forget the dx, right? We still have to write the integral symbol in the dx until we actually apply some of our integration rules. So this is still the integral of x cubed over x cubed is one minus, here we're gonna cancel this x with one of these. That's gonna give us two over x squared plus, and then we have four over x cubed. And then we still have our dx. So in order to do this, uh, we have to write it in a way that is doable. We have to write everything as x to a power so we can apply the power rule. So what we can do is the one's okay. We can take this and we can bring it upstairs. So this will be minus two x to the negative two, right? Because it becomes negative when you bring it up and then plus four x to the negative three like that, and then dx. Okay, so now we're finally in a place where we can apply our rules. So now we're gonna drop the integral sign, we'll drop the dx. So we're integrating one. Remember, if it's a number by itself, you just tack on the x. This will be x. Here we're using the power rule. So we're gonna add one to the exponent here. So it'll be negative two, x to the negative two plus one is negative one, and then we're dividing by negative one. But you add one to the exponent and you divide by the result, plus four, x to the negative three is the exponent. We add one to the exponent, so it's going to be negative two, right? Because one plus negative three is negative two, and then you divide by the negative two. Gotta be extra careful when there's negative numbers involved. It's very easy to get confused. So you add one, divide, add one, divide, plus c. It's really important to write the c, even though we're not done. Once you integrate, you should most of the time, like 90% of the time, write it. I can think of like one example uh, of an integration by parts problem where you don't really wanna write it and it's kind of understood that you don't have to for various reasons, but for the most part, <laughs> you have to write the plus C when you integrate. These will become positives. This is X plus two X to the negative one minus, it's gonna become a two here, minus two X to the negative two, and then plus our constant of integration, capital C. 
And you could leave it like this, or you could bring um, the numbers, the x's down if you want. You could write it like this, x plus 2 over x minus 2 over x squared plus c. So if you wanted to write it like this, you could. Personally, I prefer this. I think it's a much uh, simpler, simpler answer. Okay, let's do this example. We have the integral of the cube root of x squared, and we're integrating with respect to x. So the trick for this problem is to rewrite it first. So because we're rewriting and we're not integrating yet, we still have to write the integral sign. And basically, this can be written as x to a power as follows. So it's x, and it's going to be this number here over this number here. It's always this number over this number. So it'll be 2 thirds, and then we have the dx. So again, it's always this number over this number. If you ever forget, just go back to the simple example of the square root of x. You might have this memorized as x to the 1 half. And there's a 1 here, and there's an implied 2 here. So it's 1 over 2, 1 over 2, 1 over 2, 1 over 2. So it's just a really easy trick until you end up memorizing it's always this number over this number. Okay, now that we have it written as x to a power, we can integrate using the power rule. So at this point, we'll drop the integral sign, we'll drop the dx, and then it's x. And then to figure out what goes here, you basically take this number and you add 1. So it's 2 thirds plus 1. That's really 2 thirds plus 3 thirds. That's going to be equal to 5 thirds. So to the 5 thirds. And then we divide by 5 thirds, right? The rule says you add 1 and then divide by 5 thirds. And then you add your constant of integration, capital C. So you add 1 to this, write the result, and divide. And I could have skipped this step. Uh, remember, when you divide by a fraction, you're really multiplying by the reciprocal. So it's really 3 fifths x to the 5 thirds, and then plus our constant of integration, capital C. So pretty simple. Again, the key step, I think, is start off by rewriting it. So it's this number over this number, and then just apply the power rule when you get here. So you take the 2 thirds, and you add 1 to it. So 2 thirds plus 1 is really 2 thirds plus 3 thirds, which is 5 thirds. And then you divide by 5 thirds. But that's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal of 5 thirds, which is 3 halves. Okay, in this example, we're going to integrate x plus 4 divided by the square root of x. So let's go ahead and try to work through this one solution. So because we have a single term on the bottom, it's called a, a monomial, what we're going to do is we're going to break this up into two pieces. Also, I want to emphasize that the square root of x, we can think of this as x to the 1 half. Super useful to know. So let's go ahead and break it up. And at the same time, we're going to think of the square root of x as, this, as x to the 1 half. So it's going to be this over this. It'll be x over and then x to the 1 half and then parentheses plus and then 4 over and again x to the 1 half just like that and then dx okay so just breaking it up it's x over the square root of x but that's really x to the 1 half plus 4 over the square root of x but that's really x to the 1 half all right there's really a 1 here so whenever you have something like this, you basically subtract the exponents. Recall if you have, say, x to the m over x to the n, that's equal to x to the m minus n. So you basically just subtract here, so it's the integral sign. And we haven't integrated yet, right? So we still have to write the integral sign. We still have to write um, the dx. So 1 minus 1 half is 1 half. And then here what we'll do is we'll bring this upstairs. And when we do that, we get 4x 
So the exponent will become negative, so it'll be negative one half. And we've done these things because we want everything to be x to a power so we can use the power rule. So now we're gonna go ahead and integrate. This is equal to, and when we integrate, we drop the integral sign, we drop the dx. So we take this exponent here, and we add one to it. So one half plus one is gonna be one half plus two halves, so three halves. So this is x to the three halves. And then we're supposed to divide by three halves, but instead of dividing by three halves, we can always multiply by the reciprocal. So two thirds plus four. I'm gonna leave some room here. And then this is x. We add one to the negative one half. So that's two halves plus negative one half. So that's one half. And then dividing by one half is the same thing as multiplying by two over one. And then plus our constant of integration, capital C. So this is equal to, let's see, two thirds x to the three halves. And then two times four is eight. So this is gonna be eight x to the one half plus our constant of integration, capital C. So just a quick recap. When we first saw the problem, when you see something like this, when you see a single term on the bottom like this, you should be thinking, hey, can I break this up? You know, is it, is it a possibility? Can I do that? Yes, yes you can. So it's this over this plus this over this. Square root of x is really x to the one half. So we did that. Here we just did some algebra. One minus one half is one half. We brought this one upstairs, it became negative. At this point, everything is x to a power, and so we can actually apply the power rule. So we just basically add one to each of the exponents. One half plus one is really one half plus two halves, which is three halves. Then you're supposed to divide by three halves, but instead of dividing by three halves, we chose to multiply by the reciprocal, which is two thirds. Same thing here, we're supposed to divide by one half. Instead, we multiplied by the recipro reciprocal, which is two over one, and then just cleaned it up. Two times four is eight and all is good. Okay, let's work out this indefinite integral. We have the integral of the cosecant of x times cotangent of x minus cosecant x. We have a product here, so we need to figure out um, how to do this. So one idea is to maybe just distribute the cosecant and see what happens. So we still have the integral sign. And so now we're going to multiply cosecant times cotangent, it's going to give us cosecant x, cotangent x, and then cosecant times negative cosecant is negative cosecant squared x. Really nice, really, really nice. And this is dx. We still have our little dx there. And so now we should be able to integrate this using some formulas. So this is equal to so let's integrate cosecant cotangent. So when you're trying to do that, the question you wanna ask yourself is, what is a function whose derivative is cosecant cotangent? Well, the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. So here, if you put a negative cosecant of x, all is good, because the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. We already have a negative here. The two negatives are gonna make this a positive. And then here, what's a function whose derivative is cosecant squared? Well, the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. So this is gonna be a plus cotangent of x. And then we still have our plus c, which is our constant of integration. So that worked out really nice. Let's just double check it. The derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent, but we've already got a negative here, so that's gonna make this positive. And then the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. So that works out you know, super perfect uh, in this example. Okay, let's go ahead and try to integrate this. We have the integral of secant times secant of x plus cosine of x. So to do this, a good first step might be to just distribute the secant and see what happens. So we have our integral sign here. And then secant times secant, that's going to be secant squared of x. 
and then plus secant times cosine is going to be secant times cosine. And then we have our dx here. So just start off by distributing because we don't really have you know, an easy way to just immediately do this problem. So it's a good first step is to just take this and multiply it by each of these. So we need to think about each piece here before we proceed. So the, der the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So when we integrate secant squared, we're going to get the tangent function. So that's, that's pretty simple. But this secant cosine, there's not really a nice formula here, except you might recall, this is the key here, this is secant squared x plus secant is really one over cosine. So this is one over cosine x times cosine x. <laughs> so it works out really, really nice here. Uh, because they cancel, right? It's going to give you one. So this is going to be the integral of secant squared x plus one, beautiful, right? dx, what a cool problem. Yeah, so just a little thing there, just you know, keep in mind, these are reciprocals of each other. Likewise, cosine is one over secant, so you could have done it that way too, and the secants would have canceled. That would have been a perfectly acceptable way to do it. So now we're integrating, so let's think backwards again. What's a function whose derivative is secant squared? Well, tan x, right? The derivative of tangent is secant squared. And to integrate one, since it's a constant by itself, you just tack on an x. So it's just x. And it's not quite right yet. We still need our constant of integration, capital C. That would be a perfectly acceptable answer to this problem. Okay, in this example, we're going to integrate 4t squared plus 3, and then the whole thing here is being squared. Let's go ahead and try to work through it. Solution. So to do this, I think one way to do it is to simply expand it out. And because there's a 2 here, you can write it twice and just multiply it out, or you can take a shortcut. Let's go ahead and how should we do it? Oh, let's just write it twice. So this is going to be 4t squared plus 3 times 4t squared plus 3. And then what we can do is just basically distribute and then apply the power rule. If you're curious about the shortcut, I was going to apply the formula a plus b squared. That's equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So you can apply this formula to this here. And it's a little bit faster uh, to do it that way. But We've started doing it this way, so let's just continue. All right, good stuff. So we, we're not integrating yet, so we still have to write the integral sign. So we're gonna do this times this. So that's gonna give us, uh, let's see, four times four is 16. T squared times T squared is T to the fourth. So that'll be parentheses, 16 T to the fourth, All right? And then we'll do this times this. That's going to be 12t squared. Yeah, really nice. And then this times this is also going to be 12t squared. And then this times this is going to be 9. And then we have the dt. So basically, you take this number here, and use a different color, this, this expression here, 4t squared, and you multiply it by both of these, and take this term here and multiply it by both of these. All right, looks like we can combine some like terms. So let's do that. So this is going to be the integral of 16t to the fourth. And then we have 12t squared plus 12t squared. That's going to be 24t squared, right? 12, 12 is 24. And then plus our 9 here, dt. Really cool. All right, so now we can just apply the power rule. So let's do it. So when we integrate, that's when we drop the integral sign, right? It's really important. So you notice, notice it's been written every single time, right? At this point, we stop writing it, okay? And so this is going to be 16 t to the five, okay? And then you just divide by the number, right? You just basically take this and add one. Four plus one is five, then you divide by the result. Same thing here, plus 24, t, take this number and add one. Two plus one is three, divide by the result. 
And then whenever you have a number by itself, you just tack on a T, so plus 9T. Plus our constant of integration, capital C. So again, the power rule says when you have a number to a power, as long as that power is not negative one, you basically add one to it and divide by the result. So four plus one is five, there's the five. Two plus one is three, there's the three. A number by itself, just tack on the variable, plus nine T, and don't forget big C, which is our constant of integration. All right, um, I don't like the way this is written. I'm gonna write it like this, 16 over five T to the fifth. I just prefer to have things out front. Three goes into 24 eight times. This is eight T cubed, and we have the nine T, very nice. And then we still have our constant of integration, which is capital C. And that would be the answer to this integral. In this example, we're going to integrate two times the sine of x plus three times the cosine of x. Let's go ahead and work through its solution. So we should be able to just jump into it and work it out right away. So let's try to think backwards. First of all, note that the constants in front of the trig functions, they're just gonna hang out. So this is two and then we're integrating sine, so what's a function whose derivative is sine? Well, the derivative of cosine is gonna give you negative sine. So if you take the derivative of negative cosine, it'll be a negative negative sine, which is a sine. So it's gonna be negative cosine. I'm gonna put the negative here out front. Let's check that. If we take the derivative of cosine, we get negative sine. There's a negative two here, so that's gonna give us two sine x. And then here, we're looking for a function whose derivative is cosine. Well, the derivative of sine is cosine, so this will be plus three sine x, plus our constant of integration, capital C. I feel like we should just check our answer by writing it down, by checking it, so let's do that. So to check, you take the derivative, right? Let's do it. The negative two hangs out, Derivative of cosine is negative sine plus the three hangs out. Derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of C is zero. Okay, again, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative of um oh, the derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of C is zero. Brain failure, right? So just checking this differentiating. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Derivative of sine is cosine, derivative of c is zero. Negative and negative is positive. This is two sine x plus three cosine x. This is exactly what's in the integrand, right? So you can always check your answer by differentiating your result.